Hi everyone and welcome to the June edition of Wavelength. On May 5th, about 250 people gathered in the shadow of the Sim Gideon power plant in Bastrop County to mark an historic occasion. With the signing of these documents, Gentex Power Corporation, a wholly owned affiliate of the Lower Colorado River Authority and Calpine Corporation of San Jose, California, entered into an agreement to construct a new 500 megawatt gas-fired power plant here at the Lost Pines Power Park. Why Gentex and why the separate corporation? The answer is that when the wholesale market was restructured in 1995 and it was decided that it would be deregulated from rate uh, regulation and that anybody who wanted to build a power plant could, the legislature said, LCRA, you can participate in that new market but you have to do it a different way. You have to do it through an affiliate, and that affiliate needs to pay property taxes. So Gentex will earn our own, our new units, and, and someday all of our units will be part of Gentex, and all of our units will be on the tax roll. But that'll be many years from now, uh, after we've paid off debt and done some other things. So it's, uh, it's really just, uh, uh, simply said, uh, the new rules and the way that we now can uh, not only have power to sell to our customers, but if we need to, sell it anywhere in Texas. Calpine has its regional headquarters in Houston and has 36 natural gas and geothermal power plants in the United States. They are the largest producer of renewable geothermal energy in the country. We're in the power business, uh, building modern combined cycle power plants uh, in the United States. That's, that's all we do, our whole business is is building power plants. We like to do uh, plants with, with partners. We have many good partners in different parts of the country. Uh, we've known LCRA, of course, for a long time. Uh, we have other plants in Houston and, and down in the valley. Um, so when the opportunity came up to partner with them, we were, of course, delighted. Great opportunity. The new state-of-the-art power plant will be built adjacent to the three Sim Gideon units, sharing the existing infrastructure, including the cooling lake, Lake Bastrop. It's about 40 percent more efficient in converting that gas that comes in to the energy that goes out. Uh, the pollution controls on this type of a unit, not only are you burning less gas, the gas is burned more efficiently, and there's also uh, te technological advances that allow you to reduce the emissions that come out of the stack, where the emissions that are coming out are only about 10% of what a typical, normal, old technology unit would produce. So, you know, it's, it's really, you're getting more energy out for less fuel in, less pollution out. So it's really a neat deal. The new Gentex affiliate will be governed by a nine-member board of directors made up of five members from the existing LCRA board and four members from wholesale customer co-ops and municipalities. I think that uh, Mark Rose and the wholesale customers have been partners for all these years, but this is kind of more formalized our partnership. So I think the, I think the partnership, the Gentex partnership between LCRA and its customers is as important as the partnership that we've just entered into between Gentex and Calpine. It's great for the county, it's great for the LCRA, we've got a, a, a super partner that we're comfortable with and it adds $250 million to the tax rolls in Bastrop County. So I think it's a win-win for everybody. A little over 30 years ago, there was also tremendous excitement in Bastrop County as construction began here on the Sim Gideon power plant. School was turned out so everyone could watch the huge generator equipment arrive in town. These were the first steam generating units ever built by the LCRA, and the man largely responsible for this plant being built here was the former LCRA board member, Cecil Long. Things were pretty, pretty low back in the early 60s, and to get something like this, well, it was, it was really great. It, uh, made all the merchants feel like that there would be no more hard times. Today, this new unit will help the LCRA and its wholesale customers meet the increasing demand for electricity brought on by the tremendous growth occurring in Central Texas. In 1986, the U.S. Congress passed the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. It's designed to inform the public about the presence of toxic chemicals that are manufactured or used by industry in their area. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency assembled a list of chemicals that certain manufacturing facilities would have to account for.
This collected information was then assembled into a publicly accessible database called the Toxic Release Inventory, or TRI. Recently, the EPA increased the number of chemicals on the TRI list to over 600. EPA also expanded the TRI reporting requirements to cover seven new industries, including electric power plants that burn coal or fuel oil to generate electricity. Since the Fayette Power Project in LaGrange does burn western coal as a fuel source, the LCRA now has to report any of the chemicals on the TRI list that are either used or created at the plant in quantities above a certain threshold. And out of 600 chemicals on that list, I'm pleased to say that it appears that only nine of those chemicals will be chemicals that we will be reporting to EPA and the public under the EPCRA rules. Out of those nine chemicals that we've identified, they all are primarily derived from the combustion of coal. Now when we look at coal out there on the coal pile, we see that it contains various trace elements or trace metals in minute concentrations that by themselves don't present any kind of risk. But when you take into consideration the fact that we burn over five million tons of coal, EPA contends that we coincidentally manufacture other types of metal compounds. The TRI chemicals that FPP will be required to report to EPA are barium, chromium, copper, manganese, zinc compounds, chlorine, hydrochloric acid, hydrogen fluoride, and sulfuric acid. The LCRA is releasing this TRI information directly to the public well in advance of the required reporting date to EPA. And we're going to be doing everything we can to share information as it becomes available to us. And we want you to be well armed so you can help us in that process. We don't want to overemphasize because we're not doing anything wrong. The levels that we're talking about here are well below permit levels. They're well below compliance levels. They're well below safe health hazards but it's still new information and new data that we can all learn and benefit from. And so that's our theme, and we want you to be part of that theme as we communicate to, out to our communities and, and the folks that we interface with. According to EPA's 1998 Air Toxics Report to Congress, for all utility plants in the U.S., the cancer risk for inhalation exposure is estimated to be less than one in a million. As far as inside the plant, we have uh, monitoring for employee exposure sometimes in the past, and we believe that we are well under any uh, detection limits for these chemicals. Now for people outside the plant, of course, they are a little bit further away from the smokestack. I don't believe they have any uh, worry or concern about the chemical hazards because of the concentration so low, and in many instances, they are not detectable at all. One of the key tools already in place to help communicate this information to the public is the FPP Citizens Advisory Committee. The committee is made up of interested citizens from all around the area. For the past several years, they have met on a regular basis to discuss any issues of interest to the community. Each time we meet, we're able to learn more information, uh, take it back to the community. I get asked quite a bit uh, through uh, neighbors and friends what's happening here because of my involvement. And I feel LCRA certainly has come a long, long way since my original involvement with them You know, over almost a 20-year uh, period here in Fayette County now. And the more information LCRA gets out, the better off they are, and as their good neighbor policy improves here in the county, getting this information out is one of the best things they can do. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing this and uh, having them meet with the public. FPP is a base load plant and provides about 70 percent of the power needed to service LCRA's 44 wholesale customers and about 40 percent of the power for the city of Austin, which owns half interest in units one and two. The three units at FPP have a total generating capacity of 1,668 megawatts. That's enough electricity to supply over 400,000 average size homes. This is the view inside of Unit 3's furnace, where temperatures reach 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Water carried through pipes inside the boiler is heated to create steam. 
This steam is gathered into a main pipe and delivered at high pressure to spin the turbine at a constant 3600 revolutions per minute. This spinning motion inside the generator is converted by a magnetic field from mechanical energy into our final product, electricity. When coal is burned, certain byproducts are produced. First, the heavy ash falls to the bottom of the furnace and is mixed with water and piped out to the ash storage pump. Today, this bottom ash material is used in construction as a road base material. The finer ash, which travels up with the hot gases toward the stacks, is captured by what is called an electrostatic precipitator. This fly ash, which used to be buried as waste, is now sold as a direct replacement for Portland cement in the making of concrete. This is the uh, coal combustion byproduct landfill right here, and uh, this is the resting place for most of the bottom ash and fly ash that we're not uh, fortunate enough to sell. But like I said, most of this stuff is sold and distributed out there in commerce. Most of the uh, stuff that we report as far as a, a release of chemicals to the land, this is the place that we're talking about right here. This is a secure site. Um, we have a very good clay liner underneath this landfill here, and we have various monitoring wells located around the perimeter, which we sample um, on a frequency of semi-annually and annually to measure for some of these chemicals and compounds that we'll be reporting, just to make sure that we don't get any of these getting into the groundwater. Because it was built more recently, Unit 3 has an additional emissions control system called a scrubber. The scrubber is designed to remove sulfur dioxide, or SO2, from the furnace exhaust gases by spraying them with a mixture of limestone and water. Of course, we are uh, uh, pretty much state-of-the-art with all of our equipment, constantly working to make sure that the equipment is in the best possible maintenance condition and operation condition. Uh, one of the big areas is we actually pride ourselves in doing more than what the regulations require such as the scrubber on Unit 3. We actually scrub more uh, SO2 out of the air than the regulations require us to. The regulations said you must scrub 70% of the SO2 out. Presently, we're doing right at 85%. That is scrubber sludge, which uh, originates from the scrubbing process on Unit 3. And over the last two years, we've been real successful in marketing more and more of that scrubber sludge for particle board and, and gypsum. Uh, it's laid out here in an area so that the chloride content can be naturally reduced um, on site. And I think in 1998 we recycled about 40 percent of the scrubber sludge, which was the highest volume ever. It's the very same kind of thing you'll see water plants using the process. Recently, local government officials were invited to the plant to see firsthand the electrical generation process. It also gives them an opportunity to see and understand the TRI data from FPP. According to the Texas Natural Resource Conservation Commission, the new TRI requirements will increase the number of facilities in Texas reporting to the EPA by almost 50 percent. TRI has been called uh, the single most uh, common sense tool for effecting change. And so what it has done is by getting the information out to the public, it has um, allowed companies to really take a full multimedia perspective of their facilities and to take a hard look at where they can start reducing and where are their pollution prevention opportunities. And we have had steady reductions over the 10-year period in Texas. We uh, do rank first in the nation for releases and disposal reported to TRI, but we also rank first in the nation for reductions, both in the long term and the short term. So we have seen a lot of pollution prevention efforts by a lot of facilities in the state. We want very much to involve that public sector in what we're doing, not just the Citizen Advisory Committee, but the county leaders, the community leaders, the medical community. And we'll be going through a series of news releases to try to educate the general public about what toxic release inventory and zone of influence and community right to know all mean as a buzzword. Then once we have some background, we'll be releasing what information we can about the specifics of what here on site at Fayette. But yes, we don't know all of the answers yet, and we want to work together to try to better understand and help quantify what these minute amounts or major amounts of chemicals really mean to us. During the next two years, scientists and engineers at FPP will be studying possible ways to reduce the release of some of these TRI chemicals. 
This study is being funded in part by a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, one of the exciting things about the grant is it will allow this facility to do some research that can be used by EPA and other utilities to provide guidance on possible options and solutions that could be used to reduce the amount of some of these chemicals and compounds that we may be reporting. And uh, it's, it's going to be something that's never been done before. There's not right now any information or literature out there that uh, utilities can use as guidance as far as what they can do to ratchet down on some of these chemicals and compounds. The Fayette Power Project has made a strong commitment to reducing both air emissions and solid waste. FPP was the first coal-fired plant in Texas to become a member of TNRCC's Clean Industry 2000 program. All TRI data will be reported to the EPA in July. They will then assemble the information for release nationwide later in the year. With that turn of the shovel, ground was officially broken in Austin for LCRA's new System Operations Control Center, or SOC. Construction was already underway in the background on this $15 million facility, which will be the new nerve center for all of LCRA's electric operations. I remember the first time that, that Briley came in and started talking with me about building a new SOC center. The need was obvious, but you never know what kind of support you're going to get for a project like this, and I was so pleasantly surprised with how quickly the board uh, embraced the the need uh, to have a new building and, and generally just sharing their pride with everything that we're doing out here at the service center to make this uh, an even more unique and better place to work. It was very easy for the board to be supportive of this new building because the staff had done such great work and I thank everyone who did the board presentation, who got the information together. We are pleased to support it and we are pleased to help provide the facility that you all need and that we all need to take us into this new millennium and I look forward to the ribbon cutting uh, in not the not too distant future. I sat in on a couple of the first meetings uh, where they were start, starting to talk about conceptual ideas and how things work and who's going to do what and it was very exciting but it also seemed to be an awesome task. Well, Leah, you pulled it off. You brought it all together and over there our building is being built. Uh, a state-of-the-art facility that, look, that LCRA will certainly be proud of. The new control center will be named for former LCRA general manager Elof Soderberg, who retired in 1986. You know, after serving uh, LCRA for 44 years, I feel like maybe I'm a, a real part of it. And this is a real tribute to me and a, a, and a legacy that will hang on for years and years, I hope. Hope it doesn't get torn down the second day it goes in, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you, Mark, and I want to thank the Board of Directors for uh, naming this uh, building after me. It's a, it's a real tribute, and I'm really pleased and uh, very honored, of course. So let's start construction. This architectural animation gives you a good sense of how this state-of-the-art facility will look. But even with the increased security, it's going to be a very open building in that the, the conference rooms in the facility will be overlooking the control rooms so that when we have folks out to show them what we do and how the system is operated, uh, they're able to go into a conference room and see the control room without actually going into the control room. The 35,000 square foot building is slated for completion in June of 2000. At their May meeting, the Board of Directors passed a resolution honoring the LCRA Rangers for receiving the prestigious Higgins and Langley Memorial Award for their work in swift water rescue. Now therefore be it resolved that the Lower Colorado River Authority Board of Directors hereby commends LCRA's swift water rescue team for its service during the floods of 1998. Be it further resolved that the LCRA Board congratulates the Rangers on their international recognition in swift water rescue training and response and the positive reflection on the LCRA brought by their service. The LCRA Rangers took part in both water and aerial rescue operations on the Guadalupe and Colorado Rivers during the October 98 flood. General Manager Mark Rose also honored Ranger Roger Woods for his life-saving efforts during the recent tornado near Castell in Mason County. 
Later, Woods told me what it was like facing the awesome power of the storm. It was unbelievable. Uh, it was weird. Like I said, there was a black wall of water. To the left of it, you could see trees. Uh, but in th behind it, there was nothing. It was like a dried lake bed. 200-year-old uh, oak trees just stripped of bark and no limbs. Um, grass pulled out of the ground. There's 20 uh, to 30 dead cows out there, uh, wildlife, numerous wildlife. Uh, it was unbelievable. At the place where we seen it the first time, it was eight-tenths of a mile wide, the path of destruction, eight-tenths of a mile wide, and there was two-tenths of a mile of asphalt gone off the road there. When Ranger Woods arrived at the destroyed house, he found five injured people outside and Warren Copeland trapped in a crushed vehicle, impaled by a two-by-four. There was no way to get to him. I could just barely get my arms inside the vehicle. Um, got oxygen on him, began to stabilize his wounds enough, and I had Investigator Meadows stand by with him while I went back and uh, started the treatment on the other five. Got them bandaged up with sea collars and bandages as best I could. About that time, a 36 news truck showed up, and I gave asked the producer that was with them to take my truck and drive these people back to Castell to get them on an ambulance. While I stayed by was with Mr. Copeman, who was trapped in the vehicle. Um, about 30 minutes later, Mason County uh, EMS and the fire showed up and uh, we were able to cut the roof of the car off and get him out. After all that, you might think Roger would take a day off, but... The next day, he turned around along with David Gretchner and Sergeant Mike Stedman. They performed a high angle rescue on a elderly couple that had gone over the overlook on Lake LBJ. They had to uh, use their skills. They rappelled down the mountain uh, to rescue these folks and also treated them medically in the vehicle uh, while they were uh, on the side of the mountain and got them up to uh, safety. So the, the hard work and the training that they've been doing every week and almost every day uh, has really paid off for us. General Manager Mark Rose says that a special commendation award will be created at the LCRA so that heroism such as this can be properly recognized. The May board meeting was also a time to say goodbye to six directors. A special luncheon was held in their honor and a resolution and plaque was presented to each departing board member. They are Pix Howell, John Widener, Richard Ariano, George Kaysen, Mike Luxinger, and the first African American board chair in the history of the LCRA, I.O. Coleman Jr. Well, today is a day where certainly I have mixed emotions but it's also a day of jubilee for me. It's been a great six years and a great ride. I think we've prepared the, the authority well for the, the coming new, new millennium, for the year 2000 and deregulation. I feel very comfortable leaving the board at this time. I think we're in very good shape, and I'm excited for the authority. It has some wonderful opportunities uh, ahead of it to pr participate in the continued growth of Central Texas and the development of the whole Colorado River Basin. For you new board members coming on, there are going to be all kind of numbers thrown at you. Basically, you only need to remember two. Uh, that's 1649, I think, today, and 44. The 1649 is the staff. The 44 are the customers. If your decision is favorable toward either one of those two numbers, well, whatever the, others are, the other numbers are, they'll take care of themselves. It has been a wonderful uh, six years. I've appreciated it. I've learned a tremendous amount for you, and that's the highest accolade I can pay. I can't say, uh, that I, I, there's no better thing for me to say, you know, an ex-prof uh, to say, I learned from you, thank you, it really has been wonderful. For Mark Rose, saying goodbye to these board members is special because as a group, they span his entire term as general manager of the LCRA, which started back in 1990. If you leave here with a, a feeling of satisfaction uh, and a feeling of regret, we've done our job. And on behalf of staff, uh, we thank you for your contribution. Uh, more importantly, uh, we thank you for who you are.
Colorado River Authority is keeping an eye on computer bugs. Workers at their Ferguson power plant in Horseshoe Bay recently rolled their computers ahead to May of 2000. They want to see if the date would cause any glitches in their system. So far, no problems. But they are still paying close attention to any potential Y2K bugs that pop up. Most all the systems are tied together and integrate, communicate with each other. So any one system, uh, just a, one component could cause you a failure that you, that you would not want to have. LCRA's Ferguson plant does not plan on setting their computers back to the correct date until next spring. Before you take off for any area lakes this Memorial weekend, you should know safety officers will be out in full force, especially on Lake Travis. Lake Travis is known as the deadliest lake in Texas, and police say they want to end that distinction this year. KB24's Shelley Fisher joins us from another lake where there are tough restrictions. You're there at Lake Austin. What do we need to know if we're headed over there? Personal watercraft like jet skis are a no-no out here starting tomorrow at 5 o'clock and running through Tuesday, June the 1st. Police say they expect the lake to be so crowded it will be just too dangerous for those small, quick watercraft. Get caught out here on one could cost you up to $500 in fines. And police are looking hard at all the lakes. Howdy. Yeah, I'd like to check your equipment. Let's start with your registration card. This is exactly what safety officers will be doing the entire Memorial weekend. Order a whistle. Because officers are expecting thousands of boaters on Lake Travis alone, they're expecting you to follow all the safety rules. Here's what officials say you need to have on your boat. Enough life jackets for each boater, your boater registration, a fire extinguisher, a whistle or horn, and lights for running at night. Water is fatal and multiple casualty accidents that we've had over the last few years have involved boats that were not properly lit. And every officer from every agency on the water this weekend will be watching for those who are drinking and boating. We're real serious about BWI. If we catch you out here drunk on the lake, let's go to jail. Police say their crackdown on boating and drinking is starting to pay off. Back in 1980 or 95, when they started watching, they only arrested 80 people statewide. Last year, that number more than doubled. Olga? All right, Shelley, and there's something else you can do to stay safe on our waterways. The LCRA and KB24 have teamed up once again to put together a safe boating kit. It's full of important information to ensure fun and safe times on the lakes. You can pick up your copy of Safe Boating Packet here at the KB24 Studios, 3201 Stack Avenue. We also have the information for you on our website at kview.com. Well, that's it for this edition of Wavelength. We'll look forward to seeing you again next month.